take your church to the next level. And uh, like the other sessions, I do have a book called Taking Your Church to the Next Level. And it's available down at the book table by the uh, sanctuary if you'd like to get that. We won't be able to cover all of the information, but we'll give you a little bit of taste about this. Taking Your Church to the Next Level has to do uh, with uh, two aspects of uh, church ministry. So, one way that we can understand churches is by looking at their theology. And we do identify churches by their theology. We talk about Reformed churches, or we talk about Wesleyan theology, or we talk about uh, dispensational theology. There's different ways to uh, talk about and identify churches based on their theology. And this is certainly helpful, uh, but it's really not the most helpful way to understand uh, uh, churches and to help them grow. Another way that we oftentimes classify churches has to do with their denomination. So we'll say that there's Nazarene churches or there's uh, Assembly of God churches or there are Baptist churches or Presbyterian churches. Now again, this is important and it's certainly got a lot of historical significance uh, behind each of the names. Uh, but again, this is not the best way to understand what helps a church grow um, and develop. Another way we can look at churches is that we look at their location. Is this a church that's in a rural community, a farming community? Or is this a church in a, a suburban area? Or maybe a church in an urban uh, inner city type of context? Now again, uh, depending on where the church is located, it does make a big difference of how ministry is done. But again, this is not uh, the best way to understand uh, how churches grow. Another way, a fourth way that we can look at churches is to talk about their distinctives. Uh, some churches, as you know, uh, baptized by immersion, and some churches baptized by sprinkling, and even churches are baptized by immersion. Some, believe it or not, baptized forward and some baptized backwards. And some baptized three times. You know, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. And some baptized only uh, one time. And some churches, not only do they have that baptism and, uh, and communion, but they absolutely wash feet of people. They take turns washing each other's feet. Well, these are distinctives. These are perspectives that different uh, church groups have uh, come to as their study of the Scripture. And for each of those groups, it's uh, very important their distinctives. But again, that doesn't help us that much uh, in understanding how churches actually grow. Research has found that the two most important things to look at when it comes to the growth and development of a church is first of all the church's size. How big is the church? There is a difference between a church of 50 and a church of 2,000. A church of 2,000 is not just a bigger version of a church of 50. It is an entirely different animal. It is in completely different. In fact, what we discovered is, by studying churches, is that a Presbyterian church of 50, a Baptist church of 50, and a Nazarene church of 50, they all have more in common than a Baptist church of 50 has with a Baptist church of 2,000. Because size makes a big difference about how churches function, how they operate, how things are communicated, how leadership is done, how pastoral care is done. And uh, so size is a, a big issue in understanding how churches grow and develop. Now tied in with this is the age of the church. How old is the church? Now this has nothing to do with the age of the people in the church. But how old is the church organization itself? You know and I know uh, that a, a newborn baby is different than an 85-year-old person. There are distinct differences. Well, there's a difference between a newborn baby and a teenager too, right? And between a teenager and a person in their 50s who's going through the empty nest syndrome with their kids moving out of the home and stuff like that. Uh, we notice this with people. Well, it's true with churches. A baby church that's only five years old is quite different than a middle-sized church of 40 or 50 years old. And that church is quite different than an elderly church of 125 or 150 years old. And quite common, and we know this, a church of 150 is usually not very healthy. Well, 
uh, a person who would be 150 wouldn't be that healthy either, right? Uh, in fact, we just don't live that long. The oldest person in America right now is 115. Um, so, you know, that 115-year-old person is pretty frail. Uh, quite different than a five-year-old child with lots of energy running around. Well, the same with churches. So what we do is we put these two things together and uh, we begin to have a, a good understanding of the dynamics that uh, cause a church to grow and decline uh, in uh, its history. So let's talk about uh, both of these briefly in the hour that we have together. And if you want to follow up on this in greater detail, you can purchase a book, Taking Your Church to the Next Level, which talks about these in great uh, detail. So in your notes, we're on page 11, and we're looking at living organisms go through life cycles. And what I've given to you on the screen is the current understanding of the human life cycle. And you can see over here on the bottom left that um, the human life cycle begins with birth. Actually, it begins before that, about nine months at conception. But, uh, you know, a, a child is born. And then um, after, after the birth and uh, the baby is maybe six months to a year old, then we think of the, the baby as a child. And uh, we go through childhood. And childhood is historically in the United States been defined as somewhere between about one year old and about 12 years old. Now this is being redefined a bit uh, today uh, because we're finding that 11 and 12 year olds are much more like teenagers than they are like uh, children. And uh, that has to do with a lot of the way kids are raised and TV and technology, uh, hormones and things that are in our food system and lots of things of that nature. Uh, but uh, adolescence is usually considered the teenage years. So 13 to about 19 years old. Uh, the new category that's going to be put right in there is being called uh, tweens, T-W-E-E-N-S, tweens. What are they between? They're between childhood and adolescence. They're not quite teenagers, but they're not children anymore. And the way we um, have dealt with this in the public sector is we now have middle schools that include sixth graders in middle school, where historically we used to have junior high, which started with seventh grade. So in the public sector, they're beginning to recognize that those sixth graders and fifth graders are older uh, than they used to be. Um, in some of our churches, I'm finding now that they are beginning to have uh, fifth and sixth grade children's programs that are run like youth groups not run like Sunday school classes, but more like youth groups. Uh, and that's a nod to the changes that are going on there. Well, you know, we go th out of adolescence, we go into what uh, today is being called emerging adult, uh, which is typically in the 20s and maybe early uh, 30s or so. <laughs> Young adult today is considered 30s and 40s. Uh, so when people say to you, 50 is the new 40, that is right. That is right. Uh, because people are living longer, people are healthier, uh, they're thinking younger than they used to think uh, mentally. And so young adulthood today is considered people in about their 30s and early 40s. Middle adulthood starts in the 40s and, and runs into the 50s now. Uh, senior adults uh, would typically be people uh, in uh, their, their 60s or so, uh, maybe early 70s. Elderly adult would be maybe late 70s and 80s, uh, and then, of course, uh, death. So we understand that life cycle. Uh, we live with it every day, uh, and so it's, it's quite understandable. And what we don't understand oftentimes is that churches go through predictable life cycles also. And here what I've given to you on the screen is uh, an idealized picture of how, what most churches go through. This is not a perfect picture. I'll show you some real churches here in just a moment. Uh, but here's an idealized uh, version. What usually happens is a church is planted over here. Uh, usually you have a church planter. Church planters tend to be young. Uh, for the most part, church planting is a young person's game. Uh, some older people do plant churches, but probably 90-95% of church planters are under 30 years uh, of age, or at least in their early 30s. And uh, they will come into an area and they'll have a vision of starting a work for God in a community, and they plant the church. 
And if everything goes well, the church will go grow rapidly. And then somewhere in its life, it hits a plateau and, and it ceases to grow. And then what will happen is uh, after a period of time, the church will decline and then the church goes into uh, a time of uh, stagnation. And I mentioned earlier in one of the workshops today, you can look it up in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 with the churches, the seven churches of the Revelation. Uh, they were roughly 40, 50 years old and they were already uh, dealing uh, with this area over here. They were already uh, in decline. And in many of our churches in the United States, when a church reaches its 40th, 50th, 60th year, somewhere in there, uh, it usually begins to struggle. Uh, for uh, some reasons that we'll talk about in just a moment. Well, here are some real churches. I thought maybe you'd like to see some real churches. Uh, this is a church that uh, used to be one of America's well-known mega churches. Started back in 1907, actually. Uh, my statistics here start with 1915. And uh, this is in the book, by the way. It's not in your notes, but it is in the book. Uh, the church here was about 100 people in 1915. And it grew to 1925, it grew up to about 1,200 people. And it hit a peak, and then it went down during the Great Depression as people lost jobs. This was a church that was in a, a downtown area of one of our mega cities here in the United States. And the Depression caused the loss of people as they lost jobs and they moved. Uh, around 1935, they got a new pastor. And this pastor was a well-known uh, evangelist up in Canada. He moved to the United States and took over this church. And uh, he pastored it from about 1935 to about uh, 1945. And you can see the rapid growth uh, that this church uh, had up to about just a little less than 3,000 people. He left and the church called another pastor who is a, a well-known expositor of the Word of God, ended up with a, um, a, a radio program here in the United States that was well-known. And the church grew from uh, about 2,800 up to a peak of about 4,200 um, in about 1965 or so, right in there. Uh, the last five years of ministry uh, in that church, the church was uh, plateaued. Uh, nobody knew it though, because the church was so large. And when you have a mega church and it's large and you have such a large attendance, you don't recognize that you're in trouble. Sometimes uh, it takes a while before you really realize things aren't going so well. Uh, this pastor retired, and he retired right there, and they called the new pastor, and you can see that didn't work out so well. Um, the, the church, um, for over about an eight-year period, had just a rapid uh, decline. And that wasn't uh, necessarily related to an issue with the pastor, uh, but uh, we had the development of the freeway system in the 1950s, and people were moving out of town to the suburbs. And so just a lot of things were going on during that period of time that we don't have time to talk about today. Uh, but you can see the church declined down to about probably about uh, oh, 600 or so, and then it plateaued, and then it grew again to about 800, and then it declined, and today this church runs about 250. Now for some of you, 250, you wish your church was 250. Uh, for this church, they feel like they're defeated, uh, because they still have a lot of people who were there back when the church was quite large. But what I want you to see here is you can see the life cycle. Now, it's not the perfect life cycle that I showed you, um, but this is a reality. You can see the growth years of the church. You can see kind of the plateauing. You can see the decline in the church. Well, how does it look in a smaller church? This is a small church. Uh, this is a Baptist church. Um, this church uh, started in 1955 uh, with about, um, I guess it was 30 people or so. Um, and the church had uh, about 10 years, 10, 12 years of growth uh, and grew up to um, just a little bit less uh, than 100 people. And then uh, in about three years time or so right in here they had three pastors who came and went, came and went, came and went. And that destroyed the momentum that the church had. Um, and eventually they got a new pastor who came um, in the 1970s and the church grew some. That pastor left and another pastor came and the church grew from about 1985 to 1990 up to about 280 people. Uh, this pastor left 
uh, the next pastor came in and the church declined. And then a new pastor came and you can see the church plateaued right around uh, 200. This pastor had a, a very nice ministry. He, he stabilized the church, consolidated a lot of gains. Uh, unfortunately, he had a heart attack in the, in the pulpit uh, and passed away uh, after being in the church 10 years. Uh, the next pastor was called and you can see the church decline. It wasn't a good fit. Uh, many people left uh, the church as you can see and now the church is running right in here. I think it's running today about 65 uh, people. Uh, again though, uh, the issue here is not so much the, the numbers, but you can see the life cycle. Uh, you can see how there was this early growth in the first part, then there was this plateauing. Now, fortunately this church was able to see a second life cycle. You see that? So they had the first one and then the plateau, but rather than declining, uh, they were able to see some revitalization. They were able to see some new life in the church. The church actually took off on a second life cycle, and then the plateau, and then the decline. And uh, so again, these are real churches. Um, you know, the, the churches do go through life cycles. Uh, but the beauty of the life cycle is that with you and I, I cannot go back and be 20 years old again. But a church can. This is the beauty of the church. The church is not stuck necessarily in a predictable pattern of decline. Uh, with prayer, with energy, with work, we can see the church revived and uh, go on to a new cycle. And churches that have been around for years and years, say 100 years, 150 years, 200 years, and they're still healthy, if you would go back and look in their history, you can actually identify uh, a series of cycles uh, that they've gone through. It's very, very common uh, to see that. Now here's another church. <clears throat> uh, this church actually started uh, in uh, 1981 and it grew from 1981 to 1991. These statistics right here started in 1981 and it was running about 400. They called a new pastor and you can see the growth of the church uh, up here. This is 2011, this pastor just resigned, uh, just resigned the end of uh, 2012. And right now they're in the process of uh, looking for uh, their next pastor. But can you see the beginning of the, the plateau? Uh, this pastor was there almost 30 years from 1991 to 2000, and what, 20 years I guess. Um, and you can see the growth of the church, but you can see how it's beginning the plateau. Can you see that? This dotted line is uh, a way of bringing the ups and downs of the actual attendance into a straighter line for us to see uh, what the real pattern of the church is. But again, you can see the beginning of the plateau uh, in the life cycle uh, of this church. Probably one of the reasons that the pastor left, because the pastor sensed that um, he, his time there was over, uh, that the ministry was slowing down, uh, and he felt like he's, he is retirement age, and he decided it was best for him to move on, let the church move into another phase uh, in the life of the church. Now, the way I identify the life cycle is this. I talk about the first five years being what I call uh, the emerging church years. And you can see this, by the way, if you go over to your page 14, you'll see this uh, chart, page 14. The first five years or so of a church's life cycle are what we think of as a baby church. When a church is planted, we don't think of it as, a, um, as a, an established church to a goal past its fifth year. Those first five years um, are very crucial years. And in that first five years, some churches will connect well and move forward, and other churches will struggle, and, and maybe they just won't make it uh, even. Uh, but most churches, if they make it past that first five years, they make it for 90 or 100 years um, in, the, in their life cycle. And, and I call that an emerging church. Now don't get that confused with the theological concept of emerging, emergent, which has been popular in the last 10 years or so. I'm not talking about that. All I'm talking about is this is a new church that's emerging as a, as a brand new church. <clears throat> now, if a church gets past that first five years, 
Then the next 10 to 15 years or so, the church usually is a growing church, meaning that uh, the church uh, is winning people to faith in Christ. Uh, people are being connected to the church. Uh, they are being discipled in the faith. Um, we're building buildings. We buy our first properties. We build our first buildings. We support our first missionaries. Uh, if the church grows numerically, we'll hire our first staff members. Uh, things like that. The church is actually developing the core uh, structures, governance, uh, ministries, and things that will characterize it uh, in the future. Now normally what happens is that because this is such a new church, everything that we're starting and developing fits the current culture. So for instance, when the new church planter starts a church, they will start with music that reaches the generation that they're trying to reach. And so it'll typically be newer music, more modern music than say would be in a traditional church. And that's one of the reasons the churches grow because they are, are developing ministries and programs that connect with uh, the younger generations in that community at that point uh, in time. And all the facilities will be new. All the ministries and programs will be brand new. It's like moving into a new community where all the homes are brand new versus moving into a community where it has been there for 70, 80 years and, the, and maybe the homes are deteriorating. Uh, there's just a freshness. There's a, a flexibility of starting new ministries and programs. And uh, it's easy to cancel programs that don't work. Uh, and easy to start new ones and uh, everybody's kind of aware of what the vision is and everybody wants to serve and everybody wants to participate. There's just an excitement. Uh, it's much like being five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old and 20 years old. Maybe you can remember what it was like. You know, you're 18 years old. You want to get out of the house. You want to get out there and get in the work world. You want to, you know, meet people. You want to get married. You want to have those kids. I mean, there's an excitement. And that's what there is in the new church. And uh, we call that vision. There's a vision. There's a hope uh, for the future of this church. And usually, the first 20 years of a church's life are normally the best years of a church's life in terms of its numerical growth. Numerical growth. Now, it doesn't always have to be just the first 20 years because I showed you a church that had its best years in numerical growth in the second life cycle, that, that smaller church. It grew to about 100 and plateaued. Then it had a life cycle that jumped it up to, say, 280. And that happened later. So, you know, it, every church is different. Uh, but generally speaking, the first 20 years are the best years of a church's life. Well, then what typically happens is the church then somewhere around year 20. Now, it could be year 25. It could be year 30. Uh, there's a lot of variables. But somewhere around here, the church begins the plateau and stays on a plateau for anywhere from 20 to 40 more years. Now, th think about this in, the, in the, um, the reality of the church planter. Let's say over here, the church planter is 28 years old. How old is the church planter 20 years later? 48. How old is the church planter 40 years later? 68. So what happens is when you have a new church and you typically have a younger pastor who plants a church, you typically attract younger families. But then what happens is, is over time, those families age, they have children, children grow up, some children stay, some children move away, but gradually the church is aging in the age of the church structures, but also the age of the people in the church. So now all of a sudden here, 40 years in, you've got a church that's made up of people who are in their 60s to 70s, who were the founders of the church. And what do they remember? They remember how good it was back here, right? We all know this. We're all pastors, right? Are we a part, or church leaders? We know how people think. They're over here, and they remember the ministries that were here, and they remember the excitement of the first buildings, and how we struggled, and how we saved, and how we prayed, and how God worked on our behalf, and how people were saved, and how the nursery was full, and, and all that. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. 
but notice the ministries you started over here. The ministries that communicated the 25 year olds are still being done here. And now it's 40 years later. So maybe the ministries that we started 40 years before no longer communicate to 25 year olds, but we don't want to give them up because they're so dear to us because that's how, that's how we found the Lord. Uh, and so we, we keep perpetuating the program, the music style, the time of the service, the way we dress, the way we talk, you know, all, everything. It was, it was all established back here, but now it's 40, 50, 60 years old, and it's not as effective anymore. And what gradually happens is that um, now you get over here, and this, this could actually be around year 40 or so, the church begins to decline. And we look around and there's other new churches being planted that are doing really well. And we look at our church and say, what's wrong? Well, the new churches are over here. And so their, their new programs, their new ministries and things are fitting the people today, where our ministry now is still doing what we did back here. And, um, but it starts declining. And um, I call that the declining church. You know you're a declining church when you hear people say, I wonder why. I wonder why the nursery isn't as full as it used to be. You know, years ago we had 50 kids in the youth group, and today we don't even have a group, youth group. I wonder why. You know, years ago it was easy to get volunteers, and now we can't get anybody to volunteer. I wonder why. When you start hearing those kind of questions, it probably means you're on the back slope. And it probably means that you can't recruit people as well. Um, it probably means that uh, you don't have as many younger people in the church, and not as many babies. Uh, uh, the ministries were beginning to cancel ministries, or at least talk about canceling ministries because people aren't showing up. Uh, we used to have a full age-graded Sunday school, and now we're saying, you know, we don't have any, we only have one child in the 12-year-old 12, 12 class, sixth grade class. So why don't we combine fourth, fifth, and sixth grade together? Uh, so we start merging ministries together. Where way back over here on the front end, we were expanding our ministries. Over on this side, we're consolidating uh, down our uh, ministries. And if that keeps continuing, then eventually the church reaches a point where it's a dying church. Um, and in the book, I give you some suggestions that you can look at your church to determine if your church is a dying church. There are some actual things you can look at, specific things in, in terms of volunteers, in terms of uh, amount of giving, number of giving units, uh, worship attendance, things like that that can actually give you an indication of, of how much trouble your church is really in and what the potential is that your church will uh, actually close within say the next five or ten years and so you can you can look at that I don't have time uh, to go through that uh, today now <clears throat> what I would suggest to you and we normally we would do this but I don't have time today uh, because we only have an hour uh, if you want to know where your church is on page 12 and 13 there's an actual little questionnaire here uh, maybe after the conference is over uh, tonight while you were at dinner or something sit down and answer these questions about your church and then tally it up and see where you fit uh, on the life cycle most churches in America by the way don't live past about 90 years old now there are some and you probably have some here in Kentucky and certainly on the East Coast uh, there's a lot of older churches because the United States basically formed from the East Coast uh, over to the West Coast. So well, there's a lot of older churches on the East Coast, but there's a lot of churches in trouble on the East Coast. And that's because partly of the age uh, that the church is and the natural life cycle uh, dynamics uh, that they are uh, facing. Now, uh, I was going to have you do that, but uh, we, won't, uh, we won't do that. So on page 14, understanding leadership and the life cycle, what is the role of leadership in the church regarding the life cycle? I would suggest to you that the role of leadership 
is to get your church to this point. I call that a growth point. Uh, what it means is that this is the point in the life of the church where all the ministries are working the best. Uh, your evangelism ministries, your welcoming ministries, uh, your programs, uh, your, uh, your giving, uh, your discipleship, your training and teaching of uh, the people, everything that Christ taught them to obey. Uh, you see, the peak is not here. If you're here at the peak, it's too late. Uh, where the healthy church is, is over here. So the role of a leader on this side of the life cycle is to get the church to a point where, uh, to use a, uh, an automobile illustration, we would say the car is running on all cylinders. Everything's working. Discipleship, welcoming, giving, missions, prayer, everything's working well. So we're trying to take the new church and build its uh, core uh, ministries and things so that it's working the best we can get it to work. We would say it's a well-tuned car, say for instance. Now, if you're back here, the role is to get the church back here. You know, what do we need to do to restore, uh, we, today we would say restore the health, restore the vitality, um, or to use the illustration of a car, what do we need to do to restore the engine? <laughs> Uh, you know, think about an old car that you find that's rusted, and now we got to restore it. Uh, you know, what do we have to do to get it back uh, to uh, its point of health? And th the issue is that we as leaders have choices. And when a church is growing, right in here somewhere, uh, we face decisions about the future of the church, and we make choices. And I call those choice points. And if we make good choices, what happens is that the church continues to grow. It gets renewed, revived. Uh, the church has a new life cycle. If we make bad choices or wrong choices, or we just simply don't make a choice and we let things go, what happens typically is the church then declines over here. And our churches have these points. In fact, our churches have multiple choice points uh, in the history of the church. Let me give you just a practical uh, example. Um, I was pastoring my second church. I'd been there about uh, five years, and uh, we were running out of space. We only had three Sunday school classrooms in the whole church building. And I mean, the year I got there, I knew we needed more Sunday school class space. And uh, the church owned an acre and a half of land that they hadn't built on. They were going to build a, a, a new educational wing and sanctuary out there, but no one had ever done it. And so, uh, of course, when I first got there, I got them into a building program. We started with $50, opened the building program, you know, with $50 and started asking people to give money to it. And uh, eventually we hired, we had enough money to hire an architect and draw a master plan of this new facility. We were going to add 12 new classrooms and a, a new sanctuary and some office space and stuff like that. And uh, so we had to take it to the congregation, Baptist Church. So we go to the congregation, and our board makes a nice presentation and everything. And as in most situations, there were people who were speaking against it. And uh, it was going to go down to defeat. I mean, I, as the pastor, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, oh, no. You, know, <laughs> you could just see it coming. And one of the young men, he was about 20 years old, he raised his hand. And uh, he was called upon by the moderator, and he stands up. And he was from the power family in the church. Now, I don't know if you have power families in your church. It was a very wonderful family, very godly family, but they made all the decisions. And uh, he was their son, their oldest son. He stood up, and he says to the congregation, he says, you know, uh, when I was about eight or nine years old, he says, I remember sitting in a business meeting just like this one. He says, although it wasn't Pastor Gary, it was Pastor Bullard. And that was the, the former pastor's name way before me. And he says, Pastor Bullard brought to the congregation a plan to build a new church building out here. And he says, as I recall, you know, thinking back about 11 years ago, 
he says, uh, we voted no. And he says, you know, it's been 11 years before God gave us another chance to build that building. He says, I'm afraid if we vote no tonight, God may never give us another chance to build that building. Wow. God bless him. <laughs> Man, spoken from the power family. See, that carries weight. They voted yes. They voted yes. They voted yes. And uh, that was uh, wonderful. It was wonderful. Uh, but what had happened, see, and what he said, and they, they wouldn't use this language, I would use it, the church had a choice point 11 years before I was there. They had a pastor with a vision. Uh, he had building experience. I had no building experience. He had building experience. He could have been the architect or the contractor. Uh, the church voted no. And by voting no, the church had continued on a plateau for another 11 years. Because what did he do? What do you think he did? He resigned. He stayed on a couple more years, and then he left in frustration. And then they had another pastor in there, and then they, then they got me, just a young guy, 29 years old, uh, and they were about ready to vote no on me. You see, the truth is, and this is what most churches don't realize, your church is what it is today because of the choices that the people have made in the past. Just like you and I are choices of who we are by, you know, did you choose to go to school or not go to school or choose to do this or choose to that? Who did you choose to marry? You could have married that man or that man. You chose this man. Okay, that's, you know, I, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I mean, we are the product of choices we make along the way. Fortunately, we make good choices. We believe in Jesus Christ. So that was a good choice, see? So now we're here versus over there. Uh, and some people choose not the Christ, and then they're over here versus over here. But churches are the same way. Churches are small because they want to be small. Now, sometimes the context does impact the church, absolutely. But in many cases, churches are where they are because they chose in the past that particular path. And these are choice points. Uh, and so all the way through a church's life, there are options, there are opportunities, and God brings opportunities, just like he brought to the children of Israel, remember? They're standing on the edge of the Jordan River. Do we go in or not go in? They chose not to go in. So for the next 40 years, they just wander around. Then they have another choice. Do we go in or do we not go in? You know? Sometimes it's 40 years before the church, the, the church has another option. Sometimes it's 11. Uh, years. Uh, but churches have uh, these uh, various choices. So, let's, with that just as um, uh, a beginning, let's go on to page 15 and talk about the size issue and how this all intersects. So, how do churches grow? Uh, this is under uh, page, or on page 15. Churches, we typically think a church is growing just in a straight line. The churches are planted and then they grow. But that is not the way churches grow. The way churches grow is they typically grow a little bit and then they stop. And then they grow a little bit and they stop. And we typically think of that as stair steps. They grow and then they stop. And then they grow and stop, grow and stop, grow and stop. Now what's happening at these stoppage points uh, is uh, numerous things. Uh, you know, if you've been in a building program, for instance, you just can't continually go to the people for money and keep building. You have to give people a rest. So partly what happens is a church will grow, and then you have to have a time of rest. You have to have a time of consolidating uh, the gains. But then you also have to have a time of kind of restructuring uh, because you have to kind of catch up, particularly if the growth is rapid. Sometimes the growth grows faster than you're able to deal with it, and then the plateau happens, and then it gives you a chance to catch up, um, you know, uh, adapt the ministries, restructure, uh, that sort of things. And if you restructure correctly, then what happens is then the church grows again, and then it reaches another point. Now, um, so research basically has discovered that there are plateaus uh, in the growth of a church, and I've given to them to you there on your notes. Um, and in the United States, there are basically 10 plateau points that churches tend to stop at. And it's on the screen here. It's also on your notes. 
churches tend to stop growing at around 35 people or so. And I should say these are not hard numbers. So, you know, a church could be 40, 45 or something. But these are ranges. Somewhere around 35 churches get stuck. Now, my first church out of seminary was 29 people. And you know something? Uh, that was 1975. And I visited that church about five years ago. It's still about 30 people. So they've been stuck at that first level for nearly 40 years now. And they were stuck at that level before I got there. Um, and, um, you know, they just haven't been able to move. Some churches get stuck around 85. And you, you, some of you pastor those churches. You go back and look at the history. They've been between 65 and 100 forever. They go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. But they're always somewhere around 80, 90 people uh, normally. Some churches get stuck around 125. Some churches get stuck around 200. Now, 200 is uh, probably had the most research on it. That and We call these sometimes barriers, growth barriers. And the 200 barrier is the classic uh, barrier in the United States. 80, 85% of churches in the United States are smaller than 200. Uh, that is the most difficult barrier uh, to break. Uh, but then when you break through that, uh, many churches get stuck around 400. We call those middle sized or medium sized churches. And then some churches get stuck around 800, some around 12, some around 3,000. There's actually a plateau point around 6,000. Now we're just getting research on these larger churches because historically we haven't had that many larger churches. And the truth is we still don't have the, all that many. Uh, but we, at least we have some now that we can look at. And 10,000 people is another plateau point. Uh, but we're not going to talk about those larger plateau points today. Now, what we need to understand is that plateaus function like uh, floors in a building. The floor offers support, and the ceiling offers resistance. So think about this room right here. We, we have a floor underneath our feet, and this floor is supporting uh, all the weight of the furniture, us, the piano, um, you know, the staircase right here. Uh, it's supporting all this weight. Then above us, we have a ceiling and the ceiling is resisting the weight that's above it. Uh, the, probably the shingles or whatever's up in the top uh, of this building. Um, so this is what happens when you have uh, a church. You have a church that develops what we call a floor and it develops a ceiling. And what that means is that uh, you have this sort of scenario and I put this on your notes. What you have is you have a church that, let's say this church is dealing with the 85 size barrier. What will happen is this church will sometimes have 65 people and sometimes 105 people. And it, it goes up and down over the years, every Sunday. And, uh, you know, you've experienced this. Uh, in my church, we were averaging uh, 125 and Easter, we went to three services and we had like 380 people at Easter. But we could never sustain 385 people. We got it for one Sunday. But what happened? We dropped, you know, we jumped up and we dropped right back down. And this is what happens in churches. When you're at a certain size, you, you will see your attendance fluctuate, sometimes higher than you expect, sometimes lower than you expect, usually August or something. <laughs> it goes up and down. But it tends to stay within a certain uh, range. But sometimes what happens is you break through that ceiling and you are able to sustain at the next level. Well, what happens then? Well, you create a new floor and a new ceiling. So let's say you break over the 85 barrier. Well, now you may be averaging around 125. But now you find it hard to get over 200, but you don't drop down. And so at each one of these steps, what happens is we move up, and then we establish kind of new parameters or new boundaries is, is what happens. 
Now, what are the principles here? How do we break through those resistant ceilings would be a, a question. Breaking through resistant ceilings requires what I call a growth engine, a growth engine. Now, here's how I'd like you to think about this. Uh, historically, particularly in church growth, we've talked about breaking barriers. I don't think that's the best uh, way to visualize this. What I want you to think of this as, let's say that you're in an automobile, and maybe you're out in the Rocky Mountains over by Colorado, and they have mountains that go up to 14,000 uh, feet high. Well, if you're driving your car, and you're driving down here, and you look up there and you see that the, the road starts to rise and to go up into the mountains, what we naturally do is you put your foot down on the gas and you give the car more gas. And that gas then allows the car to go up over the pass. And then when you get up there, let's say this is 6,000 feet high, then you, you can get onto the plane again and you can let off of the gas. But then you look up there and you see that the next pass is going to go up to maybe 8,000 feet. You have to give it more gas again to go up there. Once you get up there, you establish a new, a new floor. And that's the way you need to think about this. We're not trying to break through something. What we're trying to do is give our church more gas, more energy to help it get up to that next level. And then we can relax a little bit because we'll establish a new floor and a new ceiling. But then to get to the next level, we have to give more energy uh, to, the, to the, the, the vehicle. So the question is, you know, how do we do that and what do we do? So growth happens in cycles of three actions. This is often referred to as the uh, pyramid principle of church growth. If you're interested in this, there uh, is a book written, it's out of print, uh, but you might find it on Amazon.com. It's called The Pyramid Principle of Church Growth. But I'll, I'll give it to you here, the essence uh, of it. What it says is that um, the, way a, the way a church grows is that first of all you expand the base of the church, then you increase the mass of the church, and then you stabilize the church. Now, as Southern Baptists, you know this principle, and you've used it, and it's called the flake formula. That goes way back. Um, so let's say, what? let's assume this is Sunday school. Let's say we got 50 kids in Sunday school, and you want to increase your Sunday school. What do you do? Well, you add more classes and more teachers. Then you add more students. Then you stabilize. You add the structure. You grow, and then you stabilize. Well, let's think of it this way. We're in a church, we've got 100 seats in the auditorium, and uh, we're kind of stuck around 80, 85, and we discover that we're stuck at what's called the 80% rule, that when, you, when your auditorium is 80% full, it's difficult to grow, and our momentum starts growing, and now we're running 90, now we're full, we're running 110, and what do we do? You go to two services. By going to the two services, it allows you to increase the mass of your church because you can hold more people in the building. And now we stabilize the ministry at that size. So by going to two services, what that does is it allows us, the two services increases the ability of our church to deal with the increased number of people. Um, same thing happens. You know, if you, what if you have uh, 10 small groups and uh, you, you train another 10 small group leaders, and so next year you start 20 small groups. That allows you to recruit people into 20 small groups versus 10, which allows you to grow. And you stabilize that, and the church is larger. Your church is on too small a property, so you buy new property across town and relocate and build new facilities. And the new facility allows you to reach more people. 
and you stabilize as a larger church. You can think through this in uh, many, uh, many different ways, but that's how churches grow. Otherwise, what happens is we move up to that plateau, up to that stair step. Now, we're going to take a rest, perhaps, but you can't rest too long. But what we want to do is we have to restructure to allow us to move to the next level. That restructuring means train more Sunday school teachers, train more small group leaders, uh, you know, uh, go to a second service, remodel the sanctuary to allow for uh, uh, maybe a welcome center. Uh, you know, you have to do something to restructure the church so it can move to another level and has a larger capacity to reach more people and hold more people uh, through the ministry uh, of the church. So let me give you quickly here just some key issues at each one of these points. What are the key things that typically have to happen when a church is around 35 to 65 to grow larger? One of the key things usually is the church needs a full-time pastor. It's very rare for a bivocational pastor to grow an older church. Now, uh, let me be clear here. When you're planting a church, a lot of church planters are bivocational. And that seems to work because there's that excitement and that energy uh, at the beginning. But when you're talking about an older church, a church that's been around for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, bivocational pastors basically are able to sustain the church but not grow the church. But the catch-22 is a church of 60 people is not capable of paying usually a full-time salary. And that's the catch-22. Uh, so somehow or other, uh, the pastor or the people in the church have to figure out a way uh, to get the services of a pastor on a more full-time basis. Uh, now, sometimes that could be done through uh, a retired pastor who will work for a dollar a year. Uh, sometimes it can be done through uh, seminary interns. I mean, uh, maybe just volunteers. Uh, but somehow or other, we have to put more energy into the church uh, in order to break out of the staleness that the church finds itself in when it's older. Usually an adequate facility is a, is a challenge here. Because many churches that are stuck around 35 to 60 are literally in too small a buildings. Or some of them are in too large a buildings. Particularly if they were a large church that shrunk. You know, uh, 60 people in an auditorium that seats 600, we usually won't grow. Because the visitors, the guests will come in and it just feels so defeated, they never come back. So you have to remodel and, and make the space smaller, or you have to meet in a fellowship hall, or just not meet in the church building at all and meet over here in a school somewhere for a while until you build up the mass again and then maybe move back. Um, have to do something. But a lot of times what happens is you're a church of 65 and the building only seats 70, and you stay there for 10 years. Well, the problem is you've got to get out of that building. Uh, but see, that's the choice point. The people have to make a choice. Do, oh, but the rent here is so good. And look at all the parking lot. We got 200 parking places. Yeah, but it only seats 70. <laughs> you know, you're never going to get 200 parking cars parked out there because there's, there's not room for them in here. Oh, but, you know, the rent's so good and the school's been so good to us. Hey, that's a choice. What's important here, the rent or reaching people? <laughs> you know, you have to make those choices. Uh, more than one family. <laughs> a church of 20, 30, 40 people sometimes is one family. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. <laughs> it's a mother and a father, and their five kids, and their husbands and wives, and their children, and their influence on that church is so overwhelming, no matter how loving and godly they are. I mean, they may mean the best, but their influence is so overwhelming that uh, people see it and they, they leave. Uh, because they don't sense that there's opportunity for them to be involved and to make decisions and to have any um, 
leadership in that uh, particular church. So somehow or other we have to work very hard at assimilating new people in and beginning to um, get people into the power structure of the church so that they're, you know, you got 11 people on the board and seven of them are from one family. Not healthy. You know, we got to move to a different scenario. And that's hard uh, to do, but we have to do it. We have to move in that direction at least and make some changes. Worship and children's ministry. In a church of, say, 65 people, you need to have the best worship service you can have and focus on the children's ministry, not youth ministry. Historically, what churches focus on with youth ministry, thinking we'll get the parents. Today, youth come, but their parents don't come. But if you get the children, you will get the parents. And so it's better today to focus on children's ministry. You know, refurbish, remodel your nursery. Uh, make sure you got new cribs versus old cribs. Make sure you got clean toys. Make sure you got nice clean carpet. Make sure you got the right new colors. You know, remodel the first and second and third grade uh, Sunday school area. Pray that God brings you those uh, uh, younger children. But you got to prepare for them, see? If you don't prepare, and somebody comes with a baby and they walk into your nursery, and it looks like it's a nursery that was designed for 40 years ago, they won't come back. So you have to build the structure, remodel the nursery, pray that God will bring somebody. What I've discovered is you remodel that nursery and you bring it up to the state of the art, lo and behold, a family shows up with a baby. You know? Is it that Why? they build it and they'll come? Well, to some extent. Now, you've got to be careful in that. You've got to be careful in that because we can build outrageously too large, too, too much, and that necessarily they won't come. Uh, but uh, I think in small incremental steps, like remodeling a nursery, I think it does help. But to build a whole sanctuary, you know, maybe not. Uh, maybe later when we get some momentum. Uh, but uh, we've got to be thinking about this. How can we uh, attract, um, you know, our children? Uh, got to get above a critical mass of 50. So, uh, you know, to have a good worship service, you need at least 50 people in the auditorium uh, singing, clapping, making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, less than 50, it's usually not very dynamic. So this is where you have to kind of think about the facility size, the number of seats, the room you're in. Um, if you have less than 50 people in the auditorium, you probably need to move to another room. Uh, a smaller room, maybe a fellowship hall or something, uh, or again, maybe move to another building off campus that would be more conducive to a crowd of 30 people worshiping and would feel good, feel better, so that when guests come, it feels like we're on the upward trend versus the downward uh, trend. Because like anybody, people like to come to something that's successful. And so if they come to a church and it feels like the church is dying, they don't come back. But you can take that same 30 people and put them in a, in a school in a smaller room and the visitors come and it feels like this is a new church on its way up and they'll stay. Um, so we have to be, you know, um, uh, strategic about how we think uh, about these things. Uh, what about breaking above 85 to 125? You need the minimum ministries of worship children, women's gr a group, a men's group, and maybe, maybe youth ministry. But typically when you get up to about 80 some people, ladies expect something for them outside of worship service. And men typically expect something outside of worship. And if you have enough families that have teenagers, maybe a youth ministry. But don't hire a youth pastor with no kids and expect that youth pastor to build the youth ministry. It's better to focus on the children and build the children's ministry and then build the youth ministry from the ground up uh, through the children as they age into uh, the teenage years. <coughs> Three adult ministries beyond worship is what you need. Three adult ministries outside of worship. Now, an adult ministry could be a Sunday school class. Uh, it could be a... Uh, uh, like a men's or women's group. 
Uh, could be a softball team, could be a co-ed volleyball team, but you need something outside of worship, other than worship, uh, for uh, every 100 adults. Adequate facility, again, this has always come up. If a church plateaus at 80% full, then if you have an auditorium that seats 100, you're going to plateau around 80. And uh, if you have a church that, uh, uh, you know, seats, uh, let's say, uh, 200, you're going to plateau at 160. So your church may seat maybe 150. Well, you're going to plateau at 120. That's what you're going to plateau at. And, and this is realistic. In fact, I think today, in many parts of the country, churches plateau at 70% full, not 80% full. So um, a church of, uh, that could seat 200 will plateau around 140 people in one service. And this is real, this is realistic. It happens. And we've got to pay attention to that, and we've got to adjust our seating uh, capacity uh, to allow our church to continue to grow. We need at least a half-time secretary uh, in a church of this size. Somebody who's there to answer the phone um, at least 8 to noon, Monday through Friday. Uh, people call churches, and there's nobody there. There's no answer. And we need somebody there. We need somebody to be able to... Uh, talk to people, to instruct people, to greet people, as well as to help the pastor and to do some of the administrative uh, load in the church. Now, breaking 200, this is the last one I'm going to talk about, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it uh, an afternoon. But breaking 200 is the most difficult barrier to get over. There's been a lot of research on this. Here's what we basically discovered. Normally, to break 200 people at worship, you need to have a second pastor and a full-time secretary. So that means you need to have at least three people on staff, uh, two full-time pastors and a full-time secretary. That will typically allow you to serve and care for enough people to get over uh, 200 people at worship. Along with that, you need to add new groups. New groups attract new people. Now again, historically, Southern Baptists understood this through the flake formula going back, you know, what, 80, 100 years ago. Uh, new classes bring in new kids. New classes bring in new adults to Sunday school. New ministries bring in new people. It's the new ministries that get new people. Old ministries, if the new people wanted to be at your old ministries, they'd already be there. They're not coming. And I don't care how long you keep that old ministry going, the new people aren't going to come. It's the new ministries that get new people. And the church growth principle basically is stated this way, new units for new people, new groups for new people, new classes for new people, new worship service for new people. You want to get new people, start a second worship service. You get new people. You want to get new people in your small groups, start five new small groups this year. Uh, you have to start something new. Uh, in your church if you want to grow. And uh, basically you need one group for every 15 adults. Now by group, I mean a group of say 10 or 15 people. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you have 200 adults, then you need about 14 groups that people can participate in. Now those groups could be Bible studies, they could be sports teams, they could be craft classes, uh, they could be reading groups, it doesn't matter. You just need to have a group for about every 15 adults uh, in the church, like a small group or a Sunday school class or something of that nature. Pastor focuses on managing the church's ministry. The pastor has to move from being a caregiver to more of a, uh, a manager of the program, the ministries, the leaders of the church. So the pastor has to begin to move away from visiting everybody in the church, visiting all the hospitals, that sort of thing. You have to move into being more of a leader versus a caregiver. You have to release other people in the ministry. You have to let other people do things, even if they don't do it as well as you would do it. You got to give people a chance. You got to give them opportunities to try and do things. 
you have to expand your facilities. Uh, one of the things that we've discovered with the 200 barrier is that almost always it takes a second worship service. Not always, but almost always. Probably 90% of the time for a church to break over 200, it takes a second worship service in order to do that. And so the challenge is to help the people begin to see that. Uh, because small churches don't want to go to the two services because they'll always say, well, we'll be two churches. And the answer is, that's right, we will be. Uh, but is our priority to stay small and know everybody, or is our priority to go to two services and reach new people for Christ? So it comes down to where we, we have our values. You know, what is the thing that we value? Do we value fellowship over evangelism? If we do, we'll stay in one service, and we won't grow. But if we evaluate uh, value outreach over our own comfort in fellowship, then we allow our church the chance to grow and to develop. Have to keep the structure simple. Don't let the structure get bureaucratic. What this means is, for Baptist churches, this means a one board system with very few committees. I would say no more than three committees in a church. A one board system. Not a two board system, not a three board system, not a four board system. Uh, I've been in Baptist churches with four board systems. They don't go anywhere. One board system, whatever you call it, elders, deacons, pastors, uh, uh, you know, just a one board system uh, with a few committees, and you delegate responsibility to people, not committees. Because people get things done, committees don't. You've been on committees. Committees are good at discussing, they're good at talking, they're not good at doing things. But people do things. So you streamline the, 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 the structure uh, and uh, allow the church to have the, the freedom to, to, to move forward. Also means, by the way, one congregational meeting a year. Not once a month and not once a quarter. It means that the congregation trusts the pastor and the leaders and delegates to them the right to run the church within the budget and within the, con the constitution and bylaws of the church. But they allow that pastor, the staff, and the board to run the church and only bring to them decisions that are major decisions. Major decisions would be like buying, selling property, indebting the church beyond a certain amount of money, uh, you know, typically thousands of dollars, uh, uh, changing the bylaws, changing the constitution, changing the doctrinal statement, those would all be uh, major decisions. But day to day, decisions on running the church is delegated to the pastor and the board to run the church. That, that allows the freedom of the leaders to lead. The congregation's job is not to run the church. The congregation's job is to elect godly leaders and then get out of the way and let them lead. And now I'm gone to preaching, so I better end. Okay. God bless you.